Hello, my name is Mark Medstein. Uh, I'm a associate professor in the Department of Human Genetics in the University of Utah. And uh, I want to present to you some additional notes on hormone function in supplement to your reading. So the things I want to talk about are uh, the transport of small molecule hormones through the vascular system, how thyroid hormone uh, gets its entry into the cell. I also want to talk about molecular mechanisms of signaling by small molecule hormone receptors. Uh, one is how do these uh, transcription factors actually regulate transcription in response to hormones, and also about alternative pathways that uh, some small molecule hormones uh, use to signal to the cell. And then uh, I want to talk a little bit about signal transduction by G-protein coupled, also called 7 transmembrane receptors. And finally, I just want to summarize some of the mechanisms of endocrine pathology. This slide uh, just summarizes uh, the different kinds of hormones present in the body. Uh, there is a set of hormones uh, called small molecule hormones, uh, which are the steroids and amino acid derivatives like thyroid hormone, and also something called the, the eicosanoids, which include uh, well-known hormones such as the prostaglandins. And together, these are generally called small molecule hormones. And then the other major set of hormones are peptides and proteins, and for all intents and purposes, peptides and proteins behave similarly. So on the other side of the slide, you can see the major uh, different receptors for these hormones. And the arrows give you an idea of which receptors are used by which hormones. So the first thing I want to talk about is uh, how small molecule hormones are transported throughout the body. So the key uh, thing about small molecule hormones, such as steroids or thyroid hormone, is that they're not free to circulate within the blood. Instead, the vast majority of these molecules are bound to specific carrier proteins, and the ratio to bound to free is typically like about a thousand to one. So that means like 99.9% uh, of the hormones of this kind of hormone in the, are bound within the blood. And you'll see that when you see uh, blood work reports in which you can often get reports of total amount of hormone or the amount of free hormone, the amount is not bound. And the total amount of hormone, for instance, of T4 is measured in micrograms, which uh, you probably remember is 10 to the minus 6, while the amount of free hormone in the blood is measured in nanograms, which if you remember is 10 to the minus 9. So there's three orders of magnitude difference between the total amount bound and the total amount free. And the really key thing to remember is that the active form of the hormone is the free form. The bound form is not able to interact with uh, target tissues. And another thing to pay attention to is when you're looking at lab values, often the measurements are, uh, are different, are reported for either free or bound, and uh, you have to pay careful attention to which one you see. Uh, so the proteins which bind these hormones are members of the globulin family of proteins, just means a blob basically, and they go by the names that cover which uh, which hormones they bind. So for instance, there are sex hormone binding globulins, which bind androgens and estrogens, uh, corticosteroid binding globulins bind glucocorticoids and progestins, thyroxin binding globulins binds th thyroid hormone. And I want to point out that while each of these globulins has specificity for each of the hormones it binds, there is crossing activity. So, for instance, a small proportion of sex hormones will also bind uh, thyroid-binding globulins. So each can bind uh, each other by a certain extent. The thing I want to talk about is how uh, uh, certain small molecule hormones can enter into the cell because these are hormones whose receptors are present inside the cell cytoplasm and nucleus. So if you look here at this uh, small molecule hormone, uh, this is estrogen, you'll see that it's a completely uncharged molecule. So the free estrogen is actually capable of simply diffusing right through the cell membrane to enter into the cell. So all steroid hormones have this property of being uncharged and freely diffusible through membranes. But if you look at another uh, similarly structured uh, hormone, such as, as thyroid hormone, it has quite different properties. So while we draw it like this uh, in a diagram, actually at physiological pH, this hormone has a number of charges. So for instance, this uh, uh, hydroxyl is charged, 
this amine is charged, and this hydroxyl is charged. So this is actually quite a charged molecule. And one problem uh, with a charged molecule is that they are actually incapable of crossing cell membranes. So they are not able to enter into the cell where the receptor takes place. So the way it functions is instead the body encodes a number of iodothyronine transporters. And these are channels which allow the charged uh, thyroid hormones to pass into the cell where they can then bind in the receptors. So these particular transporters are encoded by um, uh, multiple family members in the genome. And by having multiple encoded members, this allows actually tissue-specific expression so that uh, there's another level of regulation about how much thyroid hormones can affect different tissue types. Okay, so what happens when uh, a small molecule hormone makes uh, its entry into the cytoplasm or nucleus of the cell? So the first thing that happens is the molecule binds uh, the nuclear receptor, and then the complex then activates trans, uh, transcription, direct transcription of target genes. So there's actually two types of system that take place in the cell. So the first one is called the type 1 nuclear hormone receptors. And examples of this are androgen receptor, estrogen receptor, glucocorticoid receptor, and the progesterone receptor. So in this case, after the hormone enters the cell, and binds the nuclear receptor. The nuclear receptor is actually in the cytoplasm and it's kept in check by a family of sequestration proteins that prevent the nuclear receptor from entering the nucleus. Upon hormone binding, uh, the hormone uh, receptor complex dissociates from the sequestration protein and that allows the uh, complex to enter into the nucleus uh, and then activate transcription. And so, in this particular case, binding to the hormone is actually not necessary for transcription function. It's actually mostly necessary for separating from the sequestration protein. The other kind of nuclear hormone receptor are called type 2 receptors. An example of this is thyroid hormone receptor. So the thyroid hormone receptor is constitutively bound to its uh, DNA target. However, it's always bound in any active state, along with a co-repressor protein, which prevents this transcription factor from actually activating transcription. So when the uh, thyroid hormone enters the cytoplasm and then goes into the nucleus, it binds to the nuclear receptor that dissociates the co-repressor and thus allowing transcription to occur. So finally, I want to make a note uh, about uh, small molecule hormones. So what you've heard up to now is that most of their effect is through transcription of target genes. And this allows for uh, longer lasting responses. However, it's a very slow process. The process of binding, generating transcripts, the transcripts being transported to the cytoplasm, translated and building up enough protein to have an effect can take uh, uh, at least half an hour. It could take actually days. But actually there are some responses to steroid hormones which are extremely rapid. And so it's actually known that there are probably cell surface associated small molecule hormone receptors, uh, which are probably the seven transmembrane kind that can activate rapid hormone responses uh, before the longer lasting, slower transcriptional responses take place. So next I wanna talk about the uh, G protein coupled receptors. Uh, uh, and these are very important because actually these are receptors for nearly all peptide and uh, protein hormones in the cell. And they're also, as I just mentioned, the potential receptor for some small molecule hormones such as sex hormones. So these proteins are also known as seven transmembrane receptors because they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven transmembrane domains. The hormone binds to the outside and then the tail of the, trans of the seven transmembrane receptor binds to effector proteins within the cell. Uh, and this is a very, very large family. There is probably maybe a thousand seven pass transmembrane proteins encoded in the human genome, of which 100 or 200 are hormone receptors. So how do they actually function? And this is just a summary of what you've been told before. So in the resting state of the receptor, the receptor is bound to what's called a, a heterotrimeric G protein made up of an alpha, beta, and gamma 
subunit. And in the resting state, the alpha subunit binds to uh, the is bound to GDP. However, upon hormone binding to the receptor, the this activates uh, the uh, alpha subunit to exchange GDP for GTP, which is present within the cell. And then this GTP bound alpha subunit dissociates from the regulatory beta and gamma subunits. And this allows the alpha subunit now bound to GTP to go, to go off and activate downstream signaling pathways. So the next thing that happens is that intrinsic GTPase activity in the alpha subunit then hydrolyzes the GTP to GDP, uh, and then this resets the pathway uh, back to the resting state. Uh, so what are the primary effectors of, G, uh, of GTP-bound G-alpha signaling? Uh, there's two basic branches of this pathway. Uh, one is uh, GTP-bound uh, uh, G-alpha protein can bind and activate an enzyme called adenylcyclase, which converts AMP into cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP then binds a family of, of phos uh, uh, kinases called protein kinase A's and activates them to allow them to phosphorylate targets within the cell. Alternatively, uh, and not, uh, not mutually exclusively, uh, GTP-bound G-alpha proteins can bind phos uh, another enzyme called phospholipase C. Phospholipase C cleaves the membrane-associated lipid called uh, PIP2 into two components. Uh, PIP2 is, is cleaved into something called IP3 and diacylglycerol, or DAG. And IP3 then opens up calcium channels within the cell to release free calcium. And free calcium is a significant signaler of a number of different downstream effectors. And the DAG has a separate signaling role in which it activates another protein kinase called protein kinase C. And by this way, uh, G proteins can signal a number of different pathways within the cell. So finally, I, I would like to discuss the main mechanisms of endocrine pathology. And these can be broken down into the classes of hormone excess, so too much hormone, hormone deficiency, too little hormone, and then hormone resistance in which the amount of hormone is normal, but the tissues don't respond to it the right way. So here are some examples of pathologies of hormone excess. These can be caused by neoplastic growth within a hormone-producing tissue. And examples of this are parathyroid adenomas, which produce too much parathyroid hormone, uh, pituitary, so-called functioning adenomas, which produce uh, one or more different pituitary enzymes, or an adrenal adenoma, which will produce too much adrenal uh, hormones. Ho uh, uh, endocrine tissue can also be accidentally activated. And so, for instance, it can have autoimmune activation of the thyroid, which produces a, a disease called Graves' disease, and you'll hear about more about that next week in your lecture on thyroid. There can be genetic causes of excessive hormone production, for instance, loss of negative feedback molecules, uh, which cause too much hormone signaling. Or you can actually get cases of too much hormone administration in which uh, treatment to maybe uh, treat one disease can, uh, by injections of, of hormones, can lead to other diseases. For instance, you have iatrogenic Cushing's or iatrogenic hyperthyroidism. So there are also pathologies of hormone deficiency. These can be caused by, for instance, autoimmune destruction of the gland. For instance, there's types of hyperthyroidism, Addison's disease, and type 1 diabetes is very famously caused by uh, immune destruction of beta cells. There can be genetic causes, of course, like loss of function mutations in hormone synthesis enzymes, uh, for instance. Or there can be non-autoimmune destruction of the gland, for instance, by infection, inflammation, infarction, hemorrhage, tumor infiltration. And then there are cases in which the gland has to be surgically removed. And of course, that will lead to deficiency in the hormone produced by that gland. And finally, there are pathologies of hormone resistance. So for instance, you can have inherited mutations in hormone receptors, and you're going to hear a lot about androgen insensitivity. And then you can get pathways that are ectopically downregulated. And for instance, that's the etiology of type 2 diabetes, in which insulin levels are actually very high, but peripheral tissue does not respond to it. So with that, I'll just leave you with a diagram of hormone receptor interactions and 
hope this uh, this uh, short discussion has added some knowledge to your understanding of how the different levels of regulation of hormones within the body.